Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks by the New Art School. Our guest today is David Foldvari. Welcome, David. Hello, how are you doing, Lefteris? It's wonderful to have you here. It's lovely to see you after all this time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. How's so, it going? Yeah, it's great. It's fantastic, fantastic. So tell us about you and your work. Okay, so I guess I'm first and foremost... I'm an illustrator. I mean, I've been a, I've been doing this since the since the late nineties, ninety seven, ninety eight is when I graduated from Brighton. I'm also the course leader at the at Ravensbourne on the on the illustration BA there. Um, I work for the Guardian. I illustrate uh, Stuart Lee's column every Sunday in the Observer, and occasionally also David Mitchell's column. Um, yeah, I mean, like being course leader is incredibly time consuming. I mean, I'm sure you know this working in academia is really time consuming. So the Guardian is really the only sort of regular illustration work that I do nowadays. Um, that's all I have time for, actually. Um, but I love doing it. I've been doing it solid, like week in, week out for, I think it's 18 years I've been working for the Guardian every week. And so that and the and the course leadership right now, it feels like it's it's kind of enough to keep me busy enough for now and and the rest of the time uh, i play bass in a little jazz band i don't know if you if you if i if we talked about that before we we run a little jam night here in in south london oh wow in uh, telegraph hill that happens that was happening last night actually um it happens on the first sunday of every month uh, and i have a little studio where i make my own personal work which is where i get to sort of do um I guess more like experimental work, work where there's like, there's no constraints at all on what I'm doing, which, you know, academia, commissioned illustration work, all of that stuff is, it's all in boxes, isn't it? It's just like really constrained stuff. So I, I kind of need an, I mean, even music and jazz actually is, it's, it's in boxes. Uh, so, so I, I, the studio that I have where I just make my own stuff, that is the, the polar opposite of that. And it's where I kind of make work without any of those kinds of constraints. And, so what's yeah. the name of the what's the name of the band? Um, what is the current name of the band? It's, we're called the Jarvis Jazz Quartet at the moment, which is not the most imaginative name, but we rehearse in this this little place called Jarvis House, and so that's what we've called it. So can we yeah. find you on SoundCloud and everything? No, it's ah. uh, it's it's um, no, you can't. You can come to the jam night down in it's. We play at the Hill Station Cafe in Telegraph Hill. Okay. Um, it's the best thing ever. We, like I say, we do it once a month. Okay. People can come down and play. And Maybe it's very some samples sort of, on SoundCloud would be great as well. <laughs> we're, we're working on it, but we're not in a massive hurry. We, it's it's yeah. very sort of word of mouth. If you if you play, come down and play. Um, it's very unlike. I mean, none of us are none of us are professional musicians, even though like a lot of us have been doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just one of those sort of things where it's kind of the opposite of your usual jazz jam in that it's kind of all abilities are welcome none of us are pros um and it's a very kind of warm environment to play in uh, and it seems to have really kicked off actually in recent months it started off as a tiny little thing and it's kind of jam-packed every single month now so wow. yeah it's such a nice thing to be a part of that and what about your experimental studio um yeah I, it's, that's so that's uh near not too far from where I'm, I'm, I'm in Greenwich and mm. I have a, I have a studio down quite close just by the river. Um, yeah. I mean, where I can people see work for, for that. Oh, no way. Yeah. I'm keeping no that to myself no until okay. it's, okay. it's ready to put okay. out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Like I just, I, I like that there is work going on there. That is just for me for now. Um, yeah. Yeah. It will, it will go up there at some point, up, go up somewhere, but yeah, for now it's just for me. Excellent. Excellent. So tell us about the story of how you got into teaching. Okay. So, so, so I started working as an illustrator after, like I said, after, I mean, I graduated from Brighton in 97. Um, and I, I wasn't a very good, I don't think I was a very good student at Brighton. In fact, I know that I was a terrible student to begin with. Uh, I kind of got better as I, as I, kind of made my way through that course uh but i don't think i really knew what i was doing back then um i was involved in music's always been there so i was in, involved in djing and and doing various music bits at brighton and and after i graduated i started doing flyers and record covers for friends 
um, friends of friends. And, and then I just decided to put a portfolio together and apply to the RCA, which is where I met you. Um, and that same portfolio that I applied to the Royal College with, I sent it out to a bunch of magazines and ad agencies. And I, and I just started getting some fairly sort of high profile work really quickly, uh, like after I started sending my portfolio out. And, and so by the time I started at the, the RCA, I was already almost like too busy being an illustrator to be able to study illustration properly. So subsequently, I, I wasn't a very good student at the RCA either, not because I was being lazy, but because my attention was in a million different places at the same time, which, which is kind of a shame. But in a way, the RCA served its purpose just through pushing me towards industry in that way. And, and then teaching came along because like I was so I spent so much time working on my own and just kind of, you know, just sitting in a studio making work, not completely on my own because I shared a studio with friends, but it's still sort of quite solo work doing illustration um, and like working late nights and doing all of that stuff that I, I just felt like teaching would be a really good way to counterbalance that. And, and I also felt like I had stuff to share. Um, so, I, so, I, so I started doing a little bit of teaching. I think it was at, uh, at Maidstone, when I, uh, which doesn't exist anymore. Kayad doesn't exist anymore. I know. Um, I did my foundation there. Yeah, me too. What year did you go there for your foundation? I was there in 95. I was there in 90... I was saying like 90, 91 to 92. Okay. Yeah, I loved it. I, uh, so it that's why excellent. I contacted them first because it was just it such was a... I, I don't know if I did a great deal of good work there, but I just had the best year while I was there. So I, I contacted them first and um, just kind of did a few days of teaching there just to get a feel for it. And it was I really enjoyed it. And then eventually I, I was uh, also teaching a bit at Brighton. Uh, then various bits of, like I did a little bit of St. Martin's, then quite a lot at Camberwell as well. And then eventually I ended up at Westminster and I did like eight years of being a, a senior lecturer there. And then I did a year at UCA Canterbury, which I absolutely loved. Um, and then and then I was invited then to be course leader at Ravensbourne. So, and that was in 2018. So from, from then on, I've just been sort of nailed into Ravensbourne full, full on. Yeah. Fantastic. And what is the, are you doing any kind of uh, research? Uh, sort of, I mean, your personal research is your studio from what I understand, but uh, is there anything yeah. else you're involved in? I, I'm not doing academic research because there's no time for it. And, of and course. there's not been very much support for it, actually. Yeah. Um, anywhere where I've been, actually, anywhere where I've taught, the research has always been a thing like, oh, yeah, yeah, there's sort of research if you have time you can but, submit your work as as, as as research it goes into anyway so yeah yeah it's practice-based research so yeah. that that's the kind of thing that i'm doing but yeah um yeah like really in terms of i mean ravensbourne has taken up an insane amount of my time but there was no illustration culture there at all before I, before i mm. showed up there so there was a thing there that had to be built from yeah. They, they just kind of sketched out this course and they, they handed it to me. And then I just built this course pretty much single-handedly from the ground up. Yeah. Um, and that's now in its sixth year. And, it, and it's become, it's, it's grown huge. It's become the, the second most popular course in the design school there, which is great, but it is also, yeah, very time consuming. It's hard work. Um, yeah. Should I tell you about the new course that's happening there? Because it's kind of Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is, yes. It's an interesting one, this. So, so because illustration has been so popular there, the uni felt that it was like time to expand a little bit. And, and so I just finished writing this new, what, what I am hoping is going to be a new pathway for illustration, uh, with the, uh, which is going to focus on concept art and character design um and I, and I know that that is really controversial in some illustrators eyes i mean in, in terms of illustration that is a controversial route to go down but i mean i i know the demographic of this university just kind of london demographic really well and i also know that our industry is changing whether we as illustrators like it or not uh, and of course as expected i mean this new course has proven to be like insanely popular we've got loads of applicants um and in a way, like putting concept art and character design out there as a separate course is really questionable. 
Um, but but ultimately, the the fact is that there is a lot of work out there within that discipline, and and there's a lot of kids that want to focus purely on that, whether we like it or not. And and my thinking was that these kids usually like traditionally they don't perform that well on either illustration or animation or graphic design BAs they fall somewhere in between them and they don't necessarily so in illustration we focus on the, on the development of a personal voice the, the communication of these kind of complex ideas through our work and and there's a whole bunch of people out there that whose interests are primarily based around technical learning practical learning and and frankly, the jobs that they're aiming for also prioritize those things. So I wrote a course that will cater to the needs of those types of students and, and like as to what effect this new course is going to have on the existing illustration course. We'll see. But I mean, you know, illustration as a discipline is, is changing, whether we like it or not. And if we if we ignore new directions in, in what's going on in illustration culture, just because some of us may not be comfortable with the directions that it's heading in, we're not really, I mean, I'm, I'm worried that if we do that, we're no longer going to be no longer going to be relevant as a discipline. And I'm also aware that illustration in like academic terms, maybe you, I don't know what you feel about this, but for me, like it's illustration in academia has always had this slightly like fearful attitude to changing times. Um, I mean, I, I remember this from Brighton in the 90s. Illustrators used to have all sorts of fears about digital culture and, and about whatever, like street art and street culture. And now there's fears around AI. There's a whole bunch of stuff around that. Yeah. Uh, and all of these things are, and they always have been inevitable. I mean, it's like they change culture and we, and we either embrace that stuff and acknowledge it, you know, which means learning about it and, and we learn how we can embrace that stuff and we learn how yeah. we can apply that stuff appropriately to our discipline and to our culture uh, because if we don't then that discipline is going to go ahead and do what it wants anyway and it's going to evolve without oh, us. absolutely absolutely the greatest challenge of course is the art school within a university environment i mean that, that's a huge conversation here and that's you know one of the reasons that, that we have this podcast uh and, and the challenges you know and 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 and, and what should be happening about the autonomy yeah. Uh, but the, what the course you mentioned, I mean, as long as, as the students are, are aware of the bigger picture and That's they're not exactly missing it. the bigger picture and they can draw from the big picture, they can get inspiration from the big picture, then That's, of course, of course yeah. there should be a specialism. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, pr providing that students are trained in also the, in the bigger picture because, because the biggest problem I find right now is in, in many colleagues are, are disconnecting uh, design from art. It was, it was, it's just it's got it, and, and we should be doing the opposite uh yeah so, well it's, it's the way that you protect it isn't it like you you don't just sort of pretend it's not happening it's putting your head in the sand that's exactly what I, I feel like and but I, I i i'm so familiar with this from from things that I, mean, I remember in brighton in the computer room trying to like mess around with some like really rudimentary digital drawing tool mm. and i remember tutor saying you know computers are a fad don't worry about it um and that was, you know, that was X amount of years ago. It's, it's things just evolve, whether we, like, whether we like it or not, those things move ahead. And the way that we make sure that that stuff stays, um, appropriate and good is by actually bravely embracing it and going, sometimes going against our, our gut instinct. Well, there are all, all these misconceptions in the late 90s, early 2000s. I remember the the creator, director of a magazine newspaper asking me some years ago, you know, do you do digital illustration? And I said, well, what do you mean? As long as you're scanning the thing, it, it's, from the moment yeah. you scan it, it's become digital. Uh, what, what is this conversation about digital or analog or, you know, from the moment something is scanned? Digitally, it is a digital yeah, piece of it's, illustration. It's, it no longer it's like these people have these preconceptions and these silos that they don't understand that drawing is drawing, illustration is illustration. Yeah. Whatever tool you're using, of course, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is, yeah, it's, ah. it's, it's, it seems to be a con. I don't know why we need to have these silos. And, and I understand that there's, the, I guess there's, there's sort of goodwill behind it because people want to protect this beautiful discipline and they want to maintain it. But like, it's not a, this is not a static discipline. 
but like it's in constant movement and illustration now is very different to what it was 20 years ago and 20 years ago it was very different to what it was in the 80s no, absolutely you know? the, the, the great disconnect that's happening right now is the disconnect of illustration from drawing that, that's the only danger once you disconnect illustration from drawing then you don't have illustration other than yeah. that you should include anything should, but but as long as everything is connected to drawing Otherwise, there's no illustration. And many universities and, and degrees, they know who they are. Uh, I'm not, not naming names here. Um, have completely disconnected. They don't have any drawing. They don't have life drawing. They don't give students the opportunity to draw. So, and they have an illustration course. And, uh, you know, and it's like, how do they have illustration course when students are not drawing anything? It doesn't exist. Then the course doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, that is at the heart of everything, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So... How do you see all this uh, that's happening right now? And how can we help students succeed professionally with all, mm. all, all this mess that's happening? Yeah, so um, do you kind of mean, I guess, like career advice for students? What give kind them, of... Yeah, I mean, give them the tools or give them the ability to succeed in, in a world that is about to change uh, drastically. Mm. So there's, there's a few things... One is like we like we like I we're saying, you know, illustration. You have to kind of accept that illustration is in a, is in a constant state of flux, and each mm. generation reshapes it and reinvents it to fit their concerns and and the concerns of the current present time. And actually, that's what's the most that's the most beautiful thing about illustration is if you look at illustration history, it's always reflecting on the concerns of of its time. So so what actually what inevitably happens is that the those big truths that you learn at art school, they end up only being partially relevant in the long run. And, and the, the culture of illustration is always going to be shaped by the incoming generation. And the, the ultimate outcome of that is that sometimes, and I guess as a student, it's probably good to be aware of this, older generations might be fearful of where things may be headed, but um, illustration as a culture doesn't care about that it just ends up ignoring the old and embracing the new not necessarily completely ignoring it um, but knowingly kind of ignoring it uh, uh, what I'm really interested right now in actually is how manga and anime have become dirty words in art schools um, I'm sure I saw somebody was it Martin Salisbury who was talking on your pod podcast about this a little bit um, it's it's really like <clears throat> you know we shy away from from that stuff but I kind of totally understand why that is, and I, and I personally can't say that I'm a big fan of that stuff, but I shouldn't be because I'm like 30 years older than the, than the people that are into that stuff. But... They've become dirty words because students are neglecting the amount of ability that it takes to support that kind of drawing because they are unable yeah. to reproduce such work because the, 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 the life drawing skills and the abilities required to support the manga or doing that kind of work is tremendous. These, these people have, you know, uh, hand, heart, eye coordination skills that are out of this world. So, so yes, of course, if students want to reach that level, manga is, is not a dirty word, but beca because, because students are trying to replicate that kind of style without having any sort of ability and, and the outcome is, is dreadful. Yeah, so there's a, a kind of surface levelness to it, um, but also there's another thing that we sort of have to that we have to recognise. I mean, this is true for me because I, I genuinely like a lot of that stuff. I just don't like the way some of that stuff looks. But I also kind of have to recognise that that culturally, our age group, my age group, um, our generation, we see that stuff when we look at that. We what we see is a completely different thing to how someone who is nineteen, nineteen years mm -hmm. old right now sees that stuff and. We would normally, I mean, in my in my experience, it's not just a skill level. Like we'd normally have issues with that stuff because we maybe perceive it as slightly crude or formulaic, um, and perhaps also as a form of cultural appropriation. And like, but at the same time, I feel like that's completely hypocritical because because at the same time as that, we celebrate other ephemeral stuff that's that's possibly crude and formulaic. Um, I mean, look at the obsession with sort of vintage forms of printing, like like risograph printing. Mm. There's a there's a kind of form of crude, crudeness to that which we really appreciate. Um, or look at the pre like that preoccup preoccupation that was happening about ten, twelve years ago. Um, naive art, outsider art, all of that stuff. Um, 
you know, and in terms of the sort of cultural appropriation part of it in, in like a, in an internet age where someone's been surrounded by that stuff since the Japanese stuff since, since childhood, it absolutely is part of their cultural absolutely. background in the same way as like, as American movies, American cartoons, American music. It was all part of our childhood as gen generation. Absolutely. But so, as long so as they yeah. have to find a way to integrate that into, into themselves. That's and it. Not, so, and not be creating pastiches. And I mean, I've had one student, she was able to do that really, really well. Yeah. You sometimes get into her work. That, that, is exactly why we need to bring that stuff into the studio in universities because you, you have to learn how to build on that stuff rather than kind of um, encourage or, or discourage students from even kind of going there, which I, which I see happening um, quite a lot. And so I suppose the point is that we as educators have to accept that um, we're not always going to see things the same way as younger generations see things and and that's exactly how it should be if we want mm -hmm. to evolve this culture um and not just pretend that it's just one kind of unchanging self-contained thing yeah absolutely yeah so i hope that answers that question that was quite a long-winded way of answering that yeah no absolutely absolutely so you mentioned earlier that you know academia is in boxes mm. how can we unbox academia um, that's a really good question, but I, I feel like my answer to that would be, this is like a, how do I put this? The, the, the answer is less about design education and more about education in, in general. Right. Yeah. Um, which, which is sort of like everything else in the UK at the moment, it's some in this kind of state of collapse right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this goes back to sort of living under a government that sees not much value outside you know, anything outside of, of financial growth and, and especially where you have a government that values nothing but financial growth also fucks up fi financial growth beyond belief. You end up in a, in a situation where like anything that involves intellectual, spiritual growth isn't really, there's no kind of value attached to that. There's no support around that. So the big problem is that we're, oh, how do I say this about sounding like a massive cliche? Um, yeah, you know, we're governed by people who don't care. There's corruption. Um, there's just kind of idiots who don't understand anything. And, and the result of that is that education at school level is really bad. Um, not everywhere and not all the time, but it means that, um, you know, many kids that arrive at, at university, they don't have that basic understanding or appreciation of, of art, of art history, of history generally. Um, you know, and, and then those kids, unless they've been lucky and they happen to go to uh, go to a good school or they were kind of financially fortunate enough to be able to go to a school, a, a decent school, um, they tend to just arrive at university without a real understanding of what it is that they're studying. So, yeah, like to me, the biggest issue here is not necessarily what's going on at universities. It's the collapse of school education. Um, and, and of course, th th that whole thing that universities are now money making institutions and, and that's where the focus is and they're being run in the same way as, or in a very similar way as, as other, as any other business, which means that education is now a product that we sell to customers. And, and in cultural terms, to me, um, that seems to have kind of completely changed the role of universities in the past few decades. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if if I had like all the power in the world, I I would take finance out of education altogether, and and I, you know, education is. I completely agree. It's it's not that you know it's it's, it's I don't think that's a, a massively controversial thing to say. It's it's just no. it's necessary for us to, for humans to evolve, and I... it's in the interest of our species to do that. So if I could do that, that's what I would do, and. The, you know, it's really clear, like, on one hand, we're talking about, oh, why why are so many people not vaccinating their kids? Why is the, the populism thing, like, suddenly increasing? Why why is the far right suddenly on the increase? And at the same time, we're kind of looking at education and just going, oh, look, education is collapsing and nobody knows how to read a book anymore. There's, there's a clear connection between those two things. But do you also feel that universities, from, from, from my experience, are also taking measures that 
to make this worse. Like, for example, what I've seen is that universities themselves are increasing the bureaucracy, uh, yeah, I mean, which yeah. without any recommendation from government, from anywhere, with no pressures at all. So what's happening is that, you know, and how can that, that by, by unboxing education, I mean that, you know, should we be having a conversation within our universities, for example, about simplifying structures or about how AI could, for example, take care of the automation or the bureaucracy while we're teaching, teaching the kids? You know, these yeah. conversations we're not having, and that's that's my biggest frustration. I, I, I mean, I would love that. Can you imagine handing over all the kind of all the organizational stuff to an AI that of probably course. has more empathy than? Of uh, course. I don't think it's an issue of empathy. Actually, I don't think that universities are sort of being ruled by people that don't care about the staff. I think yeah. that it's just like I think what it is is everyone's under lots of pressure to perform, and and so expectations become unmanageable and everybody's overworked and everyone's tired and everyone's trying to meet targets all the time. So there's, there is bureaucracy there. I think fundamentally it is just a case of like, it's a case of, you know, we need the university to survive, to survive. We need the, we need our staff to be paid. Uh, we need students to get an education, but, but by, and that, I think that is the reason behind all the spreadsheets and all the tick boxes and all of that stuff, it's all, it all needs to be quantified to justify, partly to justify the fees that the students are paying, um, but also to ensure that there is, there is growth there. And unfortunately, like, I, I think, you know, if you want to have that kind of growth mentality, then that needs to be, you need those middle management sort of people. Yeah, there but to, we to seem to be that. doing that excessively. That's, you know, we, we did that in yeah. the past, but right now it's, it's, it, it feels like certain, certain aspects that the bureaucracy is increasing like the number of students, the number of work we have without, you know, this is stopping us from teaching the students. Yeah. So when, it, when yeah. it reaches that point, we got to have a conversation and nobody's yeah. having the conversation because, it's, because it's become so much top down. It never used to be like that. It, Do you find that you, you spend your weekdays, um, this is a real issue for me, actually, if we're, if we're going to talk about this. Do you find that you spend your weekdays doing admin and you do the actual core, the important part of your education, which is like designing new content, writing new, new content? You do that on like a Sunday night in your own time. Absolutely. Because that's fundamentally wrong, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's, not, that's the conversation we're not having. And, that, and that's an internal issue. It's nothing to do with outside. And this is the most frustrating right now. Yeah. I agree. And I don't know what the answer is to that, apart from really fundamentally changing everything. Do you think that it's, uh, it's to do with justifying shrinking resources and increasing student fees? No, no. It's a, oh, right now. No, yeah. but, 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 but we can do less bureaucracy tomorrow. I remember uh, when I started teaching all those years ago, somebody came from another university. Yeah. He was quite high up. And we were all together in a meeting. And they asked him, how do you deal with bureaucracy? I mean, bureaucracy then was, was, was fantastic. It was, it was very little. And he said, we just didn't do it and nothing happened. <laughs> it's like, and he was absolutely right. It's like we didn't do what, you know, and nothing happened. We just, the teaching became better and everything became better and everything ran smoother. Because it, right now, and, and that's what, because again, that's back to the point that the university, the art school in the university, we have nuances of working that are not understood by the university. And since we don't have that autonomy anymore, we lost our autonomy, our processes cannot be understood. Hmm. It's a very tricky one. Yeah, I don't think, like, ultimately, it's not a tricky one, because yeah, the answer is to kind of close your door and just do what you want, or do what you know is works for your students. And that is the answer to it. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it feels like, I don't know, is there a better way of doing that? It, why is it so hard to kind of sit down with somebody who's in charge and have that conversation and say, look, we know what we're doing. We work better when there isn't all of this garbage. Uh, how do we how do we persuade these people that? Well, I, I think it's it's middle management thinking. Like if you have people ruling these establishments that come from those kinds of backgrounds, then they don't see like they have a way of organizing things and they have a way of tracking things, and that's the only thing that makes sense to them. But because it's education, it's not a second hand car showroom. Uh, it operates differently from that. 
So it's just, okay. it's just whether we, yeah, how do we get through to those people? I don't have an answer for this, actually. I think it's a really difficult one. Uh, and the only answer, answer that I have to it is, like, you know, if there was suddenly, you didn't have to justify all of this cost, um, then it wouldn't be such an issue. If education was free, then you would have the freedom to teach it however you wanted to. Uh, but I know it's sort of pie in the sky, whatever, fantasy thinking. But I, I, ultimately, that, that is the answer to it. Mm. Education needs to be valued for the, for the sake is, of... Is there anything else you change uh, in, in, in your curriculum if, if you had the magic wand? Is, is there anything else that you would change tomorrow if, if like, you had a complete freedom, freedom of choice and of action? I mean, there's loads of stuff that I would change in terms of... I don't know if this is really specific to Ravensbourne, though, about like what it means to have a session, what a teaching session actually is, and what time you start and what time you finish, and whether studios should just be all access at all times and and tutors should be available on request uh, rather than like the, it's it's siloing and, and siloing happens because because space in london is a premium yeah uh, and so we have to have those learning hours and we have to be present for those learning hours and those teaching sessions need to be crammed full of activity so what i would change is go back to a much more of a something that's a lot closer to studio culture yeah that would make a huge difference, I think. That's, that's the biggest fragmentation in students' minds is, is modularization. It's just, it's just, it's just it, pre, it prevents students from understanding what we're doing, but that's, that's another huge conversation. Yeah, it, it kind of over, over exit, doesn't it? It just kind of, it, 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 is, it is silo-fication, if that's, that's not a word, yeah. but it is that. It's just, it is putting everything into modular boxes. And yeah. it's funny doing that to illustration, isn't it? It's kind of like, let's pull it apart into, into separate little strands. It doesn't make sense. We can't transmit what, what our teachers transmitted to us. That no, it was just studio practice. It was all studio. It was just yeah. studio. Everything yeah. was, and everything plugged into the studio and you learn things ad hoc as you needed to learn them. Yeah. And it, and it kind of worked as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So there's ways of kind of sneaking that back in into the studio. I mean, I, I try and like studio sessions that I run, I dedicate loads of time to just one-to-one, -one, like students yeah. sitting there developing work. And there isn't going to be a massive lecture today. There's just going to be two of us in the studio and we're going to speak to everybody individually for half an hour at a time and make sure that they get that kind of experience. And, and what I find actually is if you, even from the second year onwards, if you, if you allow students the time to do that, they actually the work develops massively okay. if you're not running a course on rails they that kind of independent thinking they just they take to it and they get it so it's not i think the fear is like oh no these students they they need to be taught all the time they're just kids they don't know what they're doing unless we're telling them what to do none of that is true even in the sure. first year actually you can i do I, I do these um illustration history sessions with my first years and mm. a lot of that is kind of you know here's the topic what do you think what are your thoughts on this if I just give it, give this to you as a, as a subject, develop some work around this that shows me what you're thinking, they sit there and do it. Yeah. So it, I think it is in them. And maybe it is just, yeah, maybe we're patronizing them by not allowing them that, that kind of studio culture. But it is, oh, sure. yeah, yeah. It's just we need to add like a bit of the background and the foundation in order to support that, what you're saying. They just need that, that step yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. They need a little bit of a basis of that. It is, but it is fundamentally it's studio culture, isn't it? Of course. Of course, so that's what's missing, which I, I don't know how it is in universities outside London. And I, and I remember when I, when I used to teach at Westminster, they had all the studios there that students could have possibly needed and nobody was using them. That was a slightly different time, but those studios were empty. So that may have not been working for other reasons because maybe the campus was in a slightly weird location or whatever. But yeah, yeah, yeah it's tricky. How can our viewers and listeners find you? Oh, they can find me on Instagram. They can find, I have a website, which I haven't updated in years. I'm very, like, I'm not very social media. I'm, I'm trying to stay away from it as yeah. much as I can. Not because of any, I, I don't, I just haven't got time. Uh, and I, right now with Ravensbourne and with the Observer, I've kind of, I've got everything that I need to have. Um, so I'm not out there pushing my work or chasing work. But yeah, Instagram is, at, I think it's at Dave Foldvari. My website is davidfoldvari.co.uk. Um, that's pretty much it. You can, you can email me, you can 
give me a shout on Instagram. That's about it. Great. And what advice would you like to leave us with? No, no big, great words of wisdom. Oh yeah, here's a good one actually. The the main thing that I've learned, and I'm still learning this, and I have to remind myself of this all the time, is to to have some trust in your own instincts, your gut feelings. Trust what your gut tells you is my biggest advice that I can probably give you. So, if you've been doing something for like a for a long time. Whether you realize or not, you've internalized a lot of knowledge, even on a subconscious level. When it comes to decision making, it's it's all in there. Um, so that means that a lot of the time you're you're instinctively going to know what decisions to make, and and whether those are creative decisions or educational choices or whatever. Your your experience is valuable, and that experience is what makes you an expert. You know, I I never really, I, I probably still don't, I never really felt like a proper illustrator, whatever that is. And I never felt like a proper educator or a proper course leader or a proper musician, actually, for that matter. I don't feel like I'm a proper any of those things. Uh, but the fact is I've ended up being all of those things in one way or another. And, and that sort of self-doubt and the questions that... um those sort of the, the the doubting questions and that that imposter syndrome is is always there um but most of the time what all that all that does is it just stops you from doing the things that you should be doing mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's my advice trust yourself and trust your gut feelings and trust your instinct listen to others and take in what people have to say but like um trust yourself because you probably know a lot more than you think you know Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming and uh, keeping in touch with the podcast and all the all the work we do with the Design Education Forum. And yeah, we hope to see you soon. Great. Thank Take you so care. much, Lefteris. Much Thank appreciated. You. Bye. Bye. Cheers.